Um, hello and welcome to the Journal Club today. So today we're going to talk about the NICE Sugar trial. Um, I'll be presenting. Um, my name is Seham Akkad and I've got my colleague as well, Sakia, who will also be presenting. So I'll hand over to her to start off this presentation. Hi everybody. Uh, today we'll be taking a look at the NICE Sugar trial. NICE Sugar stands for Normal Glycemia in Intensive Care Evaluation and Surviving Using Glucose Algorithm Regulation Trial. Uh, it basically compares intensive versus conventional glucose control in critically ill patients. It was a trial carried out by FINFA and colleagues uh, in the year 2009. Yeah. So hyperglycemia is very common in patients needing intensive care. Um, this can be seen in patients with pre-existing diabetes, but also in patients um, with critical illness as a new complication. Um, when it's a new diagnosis, it's called stress hyperglycemia. And stress hyperglycemia is defined as blood glucose levels of more than 11 millimoles per liter in the presence of acute illness without pre-existing diabetes. Now this occurs as an adaptive response to stress due to increased release of cortisol and other catabolic hormones, which increases the blood sugar levels. Hyperglycemia can be pro-inflammatory, uh, pro-thrombotic and pro-oxidant. Um, this results in reduced immunity, increased incidence of infections and generally an overall rise in complications and thereby increasing the length of stay at the hospital. Um, so in conclusion, severe hyperglycemia can be associated with increased morbidity and mortality. The clinical question this trial aims to answer is that in critically ill patients, how does intensive control, which is uh, targeting blood sugar levels between 4.5 and 6 millimoles per liter compared to conventional glycemic control of sugars less than 10 millimoles per liter in reducing the risk of mortality? Um, it aims to tell us what is the optimal range uh, for blood glucose in critically ill patients and does intensively controlled blood sugar really reduce the mortality at 90 days. So this is a very large parallel group randomized control trial uh, which involved adult medical and surgical patients admitted to ICU between the years 2004 to 2008 who were expected to require treatment in ICU for three days or more. Uh, it involved 42 hospitals across Australia, New Zealand, and USA. So about 40,000 odd patients were screened and 6,000 people were recruited. Uh, inclusion criteria being, like I said, a patients requiring ITU care of more than three days and uh, ones that had arterial line to allow easy blood sampling for glucose. And exclusion criteria were people with um, acute conditions such as DKA or hypoosmolar state, um, those patients expected to be eating at day three, and uh, patients with high risk of hypoglycemia such as insulin secreting tumors or ful fulminant liver failure. Now these uh, 6,000 patients were then randomly assigned to two groups, the tight control group and the conventional control group. So in the tight control group, the targeted uh, blood sugar levels were 81 to 108 milligrams per deciliter, which in millimoles would be 4.5 to 6. And in conventional control group, uh, we aim to have the blood sugar less than 10 millimoles per liter. Now the blood glucose control was achieved with the use of an IV infusion of insulin and saline. Uh, the intervention was discontinued once the patient started to eat or drink or was discharged from ICU, and it was resumed if the patient was readmitted to ITU within the 90-day period of the study. Uh, it was discontinued permanently uh, 90 days after randomization, and the blood samples were usually drawn from art lines wherever possible, and um, the blood glucose was uh, measured using blood gas machines. The data that was uh, collected during the study was demographic and clinical characteristics, uh, the glucose measurements, which was the primary objective, insulin administration, uh, red cell administration, positive blood cultures, uh, whether they were receiving, sorry, mm -hmm. whether they were receiving enteral or parental nutrition, uh, the type and volume of nutrition they were receiving, and if they needed additional glucose administration, their SOFA scores and also uh, mechanical ventilation or renal replacement therapy. 
Um, the trial um, looked for three outcomes, the primary, secondary, and tertiary outcome. Primary outcome being death from any cause at 90 days since randomization. Secondary outcome was survival time during the first 90 days if there was a cause for any specific death and duration of mechanical ventilation or renal replacement therapy, if there was any. And the tertiary outcome was death due to any cause within the first 28 days after randomization and incidence of new organ failure, a positive blood culture, or uh, if the patient required blood transfusion. So the study originally aimed to recruit about 4,000 patients, uh, but in 2006, this was increased to 6,100 patients to achieve a more statistically significant uh, result with a power of 90% to detect a difference in mortality between the two groups. Uh, the data was analyzed with the intention to treat principle. Primary analysis for death at 90 days was done using the chi-square test. Binary endpoints were analyzed using chi-square and Fisher's exact test, and continuous variables were compared using unpaired t-tests, Welsh's, and Wilcoxon's ransom tests. Time from randomization to death in the two groups was compared with the use of log rank test, and results were plotted on Kaplan linear curves. I'll now hand over to Siham. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so now I'm just going to talk to you about a little bit about um, the randomization and then the results and um, take you through the discussion as well. So there were 6,000 people, about 6,000 patients who underwent randomization and they were either assigned into um, intensive glucose control group or a conventional glucose control group. Um, and the numbers in each arm were very similar, 3,000 and about 3,050. Um, Throughout this as well, about 3,000 of the patients had their data included in the analysis um, and just over 3,000 had a 90-day data as well. So the dropout was not very high. Um, only about 10% of um, people in each arm were discontinued for each intervention. And there was a, a wide range of reasons for this. Either the patient didn't want to be in the trial anymore or the physician had requested that they um, were taken out of the trial or they were switched from um, active to palliative care or had other reasons or had a severe reaction for which they had to then be, be removed from the trial. Okay, so looking at the baseline characteristics of the two groups, they were very similar. So in both um, groups, the mean age was very similar. It was 60, about 60 years old. 60% um, of the patients were male um, and they had similar mean Apache 2 scores and um, the operative admissions were about the same percentage as well. And the, the duration of stay was very similar too. Um, interestingly, patients undergoing the intensive glucose control were more likely to have received insulin, which is probably um, quite obvious and expected. Um, so almost 98%, 97% of the people required insulin during the trial in the intensive glucose group rather than the conventional group. And uh, on average, they received a larger mean insulin dose as well in the intensive group compared to the conventional group. And the mean time weighted blood glucose level um, in the intensive group was, slow, was lower at 6.4 millimoles per liter compared to eight millimoles per liter in the conventional group. So here you can see that this um, is a graph that was taken from the original study and it shows the, the mean glucose levels in the conventional group compared to the intensive uh, glucose group um, and it shows it um, after days after randomization as you can see here and you can see that on average the conventional glucose uh, control group had a much higher glucose level compared to the intensive glucose control group. And then this again is taken from the same from the same uh, study as we've discussed. And as you can see, um, they both have a, a mean uh, a, ram, uh, a, a distribution curve here, standard distribution curve. And the intensive control glucose, the, the median was lower than the conventional group, as you can see here. Okay. So looking at the primary the outcomes. So the primary outcome did show a statistically significant difference in 90-day mortality that favoured the conventional control group, which was probably not what they thought was going to happen. Um, so 
the intensive control group had a 27.5% um, chance of mortality compared to the conventional control group, which was 24.9%. And the absolute difference in mortality was 2.6%, which was statistically significant with a PE value of 0 0.02. And this was even after adjustment for the predefined baseline risk factors. And majority of these deaths were from cardiovascular causes. Um, and this was more common in the intensive control group, 41.6% versus 35.8%. And here you can see the Kaplan-Meier plot, which was taken from the original study. And as you can see, early within the study, the, the curves are very close together. But then as you go further past the randomization, um, to 90 days, there is a, a clear difference between the conventional glucose group and intensive glucose therapy. And the probability of survival for the conventional glucose control group was much higher compared to the intensive glucose control group. Okay. So the secondary outcome was showing also that there was a significant difference in the incidence of severe hypoglycemia. And so there was many more cases in the intensive control group, 272 compared to 16 in the conventional group, conventional control group. But there was no difference in mortality at 28 days, as we saw in the previous plot, median length of stay, um, development of new organ failure, numbers of days of mechanical ventilation or renal replacement therapy, and rates of red cell transfusion or positive blood cultures. Okay, so in, in summary, the author concluded that we should, a blood glucose target of less than 10 millimoles resulted in a lower mortality than a target of 4.5 to 6 millimoles. And we should not use a lower target in critically ill adults, which is why we normally target between 6 and 10 um, in intensive care unit for glucose. So I'm now going to talk to you about the strength of the design, uh, the strengths of this uh, study. So I thought it was well designed, pragmatic study, and it was designed to answer a clinically relevant research question. Um, there was only 2.4% that withdrew consent and only a small amount were lost to follow up, which shows a negligible attrition bias. 99.5% uh, were administered the correct management according to the study algorithm, which is good, which means that the, the control trial worked as it was meant to. And this strengthens the internal validity of, um, of the results. So the weaknesses, there were some people that discontinued the treatment uh, prematurely in about 10% of patients in the intervention group and 7.4% of the conventional control group. And this was due to either the physician making a decision or change to the palliative care. And this may have introduced bias because this trial was not blinded uh, to clinicians. So that might have changed depending on how the patient was doing. Uh, more patients in the intensive control group received corticosteroids, and this may affect the measured outcome, but this is very difficult to understand how it would have affected the results. Um, the median blood glucose level achieved in the intensive control group was 6.4, which is above the target of 4.5 to 6. And it, it shows that it's very difficult to achieve a blood glucose level in this target range and may have reduced as the observed difference between the two groups. Um, and the majority of patients received the nutrition by enteral feeding and perhaps this, this reduces the generalizability to patients that are fed parenterally. And they don't, the authors don't actually discuss why there is a difference in mortality at 90 days but not at 28 days. Um, is it because there is a a change um, long-standing for having lower blood glucose levels, maybe affecting cardiovascular system. Um, and they, I think they need to discuss a little bit more about why there was an effect on late survival odds. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll just take you on to questions now. Uh, and then this is the references for the for the um, talk. Thank you. So I think we've got a question from Alex. How did they arrive at 4.5 to 6 as the range for the more intensive arm? Is there an argument for tight control but less than 10, 6 to 8? 
and there are there any studies looking at it okay so they, they didn't actually discuss how they were going to decide on the 4.5 to 6 I think they just chose it it was an arbitrary value yeah. not entirely arbitrary okay there was a study before by Bridget Vandenberg who did studies looking at tight glycemic control and initially that was thought to be better because you reduce infective complications and she found a similar outcome but there was a concern that in the tighter control arm that she used there was a higher rate of hypoglycemic episodes which is what led on to the nice sugar study being done so the reason for that range is because that was the range that was used in that earlier study Um, okay, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, maybe there, it would be better to, to try to go for a higher uh, level, six to eight, rather than just having less than 10. That would be very good. Um, I don't know if there are any studies looking at it at the moment. Do you know, Sakia? Um, no, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, any other questions or comments from anyone? Okay, so if, if there's no further questions or comments, then we can stop there. And then um, next week, we've got another talk from, uh, who is it from next week? It's, oh, it's tomorrow. Well, Steve, Augustine and Helen about the placebo trial. So that's what it's going to be.